right, you are. And the, the, the actual pitch of the bass, the low pitch, is going to sort itself out. And by the way, if there was some sort of imperfection there, it would be pretty difficult for anyone to notice as long as the first harmonic and the tenors lined up. This is how physics works. This is why the bass is tricky to tune, because most of us are accidentally, unknowingly trying to do something that's impossible to do. Good morning, Jim. And a good morning to you, Andrew. That's about as much as we have planned for today. Yep. It's been a good week. Yeah. So good episode. Have another good one. Thanks for tuning in. <laughs> I've gotten lots of compliments on our on our rapport. For example, I was just I just had a brief check in with Big Rab from the Big Rab show. He's a big yeah. fan. He's a big fan of the uh, what would you call this? I'm not sure. That that Rab doesn't do anything if he's not gonna do it big. Exactly. Big Rab, big fan. Exactly right. You know what I think it probably is, is that Big Rab has been pulling it off solo weekly for a very long time, and he probably is tired. Well, that, and I think that's that, the... You know, having a second person to bounce stuff off of could be useful. That's right. His <laughs> talent is his curse. So I, for example, mm. a lot of people don't know this, but the Dojo, the Piper's Dojo podcast had hundreds of episodes before we met, but I wasn't pulling it off at all. It was clear a change was needed. And that's where we develop the host co-host system. And I'll let the audience decide who the host is and who the co-host is. And there we go. In the comments below, let us know who's hosting, who's co-hosting. Exactly. And, and also, how many is too many? Is there a future decades yeah. from now when the Dojo podcast will be like 12 talking heads all talking at the same time? I, we'll go Anchorman 2 on this. Many of our listeners will have seen the Dan Nevins episode. That was three, and I already felt like that was too much. Just kidding. Dan might yeah, Dan's actually got be the same talent as Rab, yeah. though. He, yeah. Dan could totally host a show all by himself. Yes. And it would be fun and entertaining. Yeah, he would pull it off, yeah. wouldn't he? Yeah. Freaking Dan Evans. All right, let's get so into it. I was reading a very old book, and like very old books can be fun because, especially if the very old book is about even older things, because then you're kind of studying the even older thing, but you're also studying the time in which this very old book was being written. And that can be fun. So there's this book that probably a lot of people have heard of. It's just called The Highland Bagpipe. And it's got a really long subtitle, like old books often do, by a person named Manson, W.L. Manson. Okay. And it was published in 1901. All right. So in 1901, that was Manson when, is writing about... That was back in the age of real but, piping. We can say that about any time we want, right? That was when they were really piping. <laughs> yeah, that's when they were really doing it. <laughs> and And the fun thing is that Manson in 1901 is writing about how in the centuries before then, that's when it was real yes, piping. Yes, <laughs> of course. That's right. <laughs> it's what we always do, right? Mm -hmm. and, and Manson suggests there in 1901 that it was originally just basically just a chanter. Then it goes chanter with a bag, so we get a goose. Then we get chanter with one drone. Then we get chanter with two drones. But that it's inconsistent what the drones are doing. There's something going on in, in Breton. <laughs> Is that how you say that region of France? Br Brittany, in Brittany. I'm going to let you fall on that sword. <laughs> I have, I have no idea. fallen on that sword so many times, I still can't get it through my head. But there's something else going on in other parts of the world as well, of course, with all these things coming together to eventually give us the modern bagpipe that we know of today. This is me saying, I sure don't really know much about this, but I don't think the bagpipe has always looked the way that this one hanging on my wall looks right now. No, what as a matter think, of fact, Andrew? yeah, and as a matter of fact, because, you know, I know the facts on this, Jim. Yes, as a, matter you know. of, as a matter of fact, yeah, the bagpipe as a concept, I like to think of it as really not a whole lot more than um, all the bagpipe really is, is that idea where it's like, wait, if I hook a bag, if I hook like a reservoir up to my instrument, then conceptually I can keep it going constantly and I don't have to stop playing, right? I have always loved the practicality of the name of the instrument. Yes. It's not something super fancy. It's just, just a bag, a bag pipe, Yeah, just that's... hooked a bag up to the pipe. That's it. Mm -hmm. Right? And eh. <laughs> Yeah, and then who knows how many pipes it might be, right? And, I, and so I think mm -hmm. you're right. I think it must have started with the goose. So people are doing their pipe things. People mm -hmm. are doing pipe-related pipe musical things. And then someone has the idea that they could hook it up. But of course, a whistle wouldn't quite work. I don't think you can hook a bag up to a whistle, at least not very easily. It helps that the reed provides... That airflow would be weird. Right. The reed provides a lot of resistance. So the double reed mm. must have come first, or at least a, maybe not double reed, but a reed must have come first 
that where the resistance, right? And then how the reed interacts with that air resistance, that's a prerequisite. And people probably horse around with that for a while. And then somebody probably co-mingled the idea of an air reservoir with the reed and then the bagpipe was born. I wonder what the other, I wonder what else was going on in the world that allowed those two ideas to meet up. Who knows? Cause it was thousands mm-hmm. of years ago, presumably. Right. But it's like, we have this reservoir full of air and we can actually apply pressure to it and then we can blow air or maybe it was water or who knows. But I I love thinking about that kind of stuff because yeah, at some point the bagpipe was born, but that's all it is. And then since then, as we all know, we've got small pipes, we've got shuttle pipes, we've got border pipes, we've got Breton pipes, we've got Great Highland bagpipes. There's still Middle Eastern forms of bagpipes, I think. There's some really horrifying ones that are clearly just an animal whose insides have been removed and then they stuck a chanter in, in one of the orifices. That's great when you can still see the, the shape yeah. of the animal. In the... <laughs> but those are all bagpipes because yeah. really all a bagpipe is is just the bag connected to the pipe for the purposes of continual playing. That's it. Uh, yeah. And then I... what's interesting about the Great Highland Bagpipe in my estimation, and again, it's we're I'm an extremely amateur historian here, extremely, but is that it sort of mm. got calcified in time, right? So you had probably a lot of bagpipes going on, but then you had then you had the putting down of the Jacobite rebellions, okay, and then where there was this thing going on, this bagpipe thing, and then in our attempts, and by our, I just mean us because we're on the other side of it. I don't mean, mm. I don't mean you were uh, pro apparently or anti. the humans who came out on top in the, yeah. Yes. I don't it. mean yeah. this to be a trigger. This is just me brainstorming. I, I, it occurred to me that might you're, trigger you're about some people. To, but... You're about to start the next Jacobite uprising. Right. You know, people are going to hear this and come up in arms against you. For sure. But that was a big deal. And uh, anyway, the group of people who came out on the other side of it, whoever they are, at some mm-hmm. point realized as often seems to happen during these situations, they often realize, whoa, that was actually a pretty cool element of this group of people that we just basically, anyway, we'll mm, leave it there. Yeah. Right. That was a pretty cool element. We should do what we can to preserve it. And so then through these preservation efforts, we developed the competition system. And through the competition system, we really calcify the GHB, Great Highland Bagpipe, into the form that we know today into a sort of unchanging form that has remained standardized for a couple hundred years now, right? Which is the three drones, yeah, right? The three drones, the the specific kind of chanter with the Mixolydian scale. And of course there are other types of bagpipes, but interestingly, the competition system and pipe bands and solos have really sort of made the Great Highland bagpipe a super prominent form of the instrument. I don't think the bagpipe would exist in the form it does today if the competition system was never invented. Because I seem to remember reading about the fact that the early competitions, there were no prescribed number of drones that you needed. Mm -hmm. And I think people playing the three drone pipes were not super thrilled when the two droners showed up and won the competitions because they were playing a, Mm. they were playing an instrument that was easier. In their estimation. They should go longer, et, et, sure. et cetera. And it's easier to operate and there's less to bring into tune and so on and so forth. And so I think at some point the three drone instrument was prescribed and the rest is yeah, history. For, for sake of competition, you're saying. Mm-hmm. Like to level the playing field, exactly. say we got to make this fair. That's exactly right. And then I, you were mentioning, maybe before we press record, but you're mentioning William Donaldson. I'm sure in one of his books, this is where I read that. Yeah. That seems really likely. The The one that he recently put out has a painting of a two-drone piper on the front. Yeah. Which I've mentioned before is just such a cool painting. That's After seeing that cover is the first time I purposely corked off my bass drone to just go play two drone, two mm-hmm. tenors for a while wow. just to see what it felt like because I wanted to feel like that cool guy on the front of that book. Yeah, <laughs> you don't. And then it turns out when you turn off the bass drone and you play with just a couple of tenors or something, it turns out it's not actually that cool, right? The bass drone is, <laughs> the the bass drone, as it There's turns out. There's a reason out, it's stuck around, huh? Yeah, just one. I feel basically the same way. That third tenor adds just that little bit more depth and a little bit more resonance. If you can really lock everything into tune, the GHB, it turns out, it's a really cool sounding instrument. 
and it doesn't surprise me that this is what we've arrived at. I like my instrument. I think it's a lot of fun to play and to listen to. And I have a I have a hard time coming up with any reason to see that I to say that I'm happy for um a military engagement to have occurred just because I, I I have a bleeding heart and feel bad for the people who who die and suffer and such things. But I can't help thinking if it weren't for, I don't know, maybe like the Great War, World War One, how solidified would this instrument be and how vibrant would the playing yeah. and competing, et cetera, community be? That's maybe quite necessary for this to have come out the way that it did. That seems like a great point to me that I hadn't considered. Of course, the militarization of the bagpipe must have played a huge role in it as well. And just mm. the fact that you, you had to have huge quantities of pipers that are probably playing something that's fairly uniform in design. So that probably mm. really perpetuated this specific design of instrument as well. Great point. I'd imagine that even things like the capacity for manufacturing, the tooling and things like that, once that's in place, then even in peacetime afterward, you have a really regularized sizes and shapes and that yep. kind of thing going on. And you um, have the availability of instruments as well, right? So instead of designing a new uh, yeah, instrument, yeah, good point. instead of designing a new instrument, you have, you have grandfather's bagpipes that haven't been played in a while. Mm. So let's give those a go. So they would get passed down as well. Yeah, that makes sense. Now, when I did that a while ago where I corked off my bass drone and was playing just tenors, I do feel like over, a, I did that for a couple weeks straight, just like daily, I was just playing tenors. And I feel like I did get better at tuning my tenor drones, maybe somewhat quickly, actually, just because spending enough time just humming along with it in my head, I could get into that zone a little more directly, <laughs> the tone zone, tone zone. a little oh, more directly God. and oh, find the spot. Don't, just don't. <laughs> and getting the two tenors to sing together, I'm not saying it's easy, it can be a challenge, but compared to what happened after a couple of weeks when I brought my bass drone back in, that was like, I was suddenly swimming in the deep end. And honestly, I'm still there. I was striking up my pipes just yesterday and just thinking to myself, like, I think this sounds okay, but man, I don't know. I, I move a tenor and I can go, oh, that was too far. But I move a bass and I'm like, maybe that's fine. Maybe it was fine before. I'm not there, man. I can't click in. And maybe that I'm tempted. I'm tempted, Andrew. I'm, I'm tempted to say I don't have the ear. Uh, like I'm tempted to say like some people can do this and some people can't. Yeah. And I'm one of the people who can't. I just can't tune my bass drone. Well, um, you know? are we going to, so we, we need to make a decision. Are we going to make this episode about the fact that you do have the ear or are we going to make this episode about tuning the bass drone? Because we have to do um, one or the other. I can't do both in one show. You, if we go with, I do have the ear, are you going to tell me the magic was in me all along? Because if that's the case, we can skip to the end and then we can just talk about tuning a bass Let's drone. Let's talk about <laughs> tuning the bass drone today. And then in a future episode, we'll talk about how you do have the ear. Okay, deal. You'll be able to deduce that you do have the ear from some of the things we say in today's episode anyway. Okay. Then let's, do we start before I've got, if we're talking hypothetically, timeline-wise, have I got my tenor drones all in tune and everything's set now and now I turn on my bass, what do I do from there? Or does it, does what I do to get it in tune start before that point in time? Well, that's, uh, that's sort of a long story. So wait, what was mm. the question again? <laughs> it was a convoluted question. I apologize for that. At what point of time, I'm, I'm imagining to myself, like, hypothetically, I'm striking in my pipes, I'm in my backyard, I'm playing, I've got my tenor drones in tune, things are feeling pretty good, and then I bring in my bass. Is that where the how to tune your bass drone starts, or does it start before that point in time? Conceptually, I think the biggest thing is, the biggest thing we want to do first is to tune two like things together. That's the first mm -hmm. skill that we need to have which it just so happens we do have two like things that we can do this with on the, on the bagpipe, which would be the two tenors, right? Really very like, yeah, they're very like, as a matter of fact, as long as they're set up well, they're calibrated properly for all intents and purposes, we should consider them to be identical, right? T middle tenor, outside tenor, exactly the same. So the first step, the first tuning skill, let's say that we want to develop is tuning those two things together. Making sense? Yes, making sense. By the way, I'm just, the reason I'm slightly distracted is I'm sending you some stuff. And I'm slightly distracted because I'm looking at this yeah. stuff as it comes in. So, I'm thinking, oh, I see how that could be applicable. Oh. <laughs> right. So we've got the two things that are exactly the same. And then we tune them together and we do this thing called listening for beats, right? Where 
where two things or wah-wahs. the wawas exactly the two things when they're not in tune are going to produce wawas and let's not get all the way into it today because that would be a really long story but basically wawas are caused by hashtag #physics it's wave interference Science. yeah when two things are vibrating they're vibrating very fast but the difference between them is somewhat slight and literally the air pressure changes caused by the two reeds are causing this slow wah-wah sound, right? Sometimes when they're quite close to being in tune, the wah-wahs are very slow, like wow, wow, wow. Ever heard that phenomenon when you listen to a bagpiper or interestingly, like when you listen to an electronic pipe chanter, the good sounding ones are actually not, the drones aren't perfectly in tune. It's really strange. That is interesting. Yeah. yeah. And you also, when you listen to a great pipe band where you couldn't imagine the drones being any better, if you're honest with yourself, you're also hearing a slight, a uh, very slight mm-hmm. ongoing thing. I think we talked about this in recent weeks. Maybe imperfection is actually part of it, as long as it's not too imperfect, yeah. but I digress. But anyway, and then if the, the further the drones are from being exactly the same frequency, okay, otherwise known as the further out of tune they get. The wah-wahs speed up. Right, when you hear the wah-wahs speed up, you yeah. like that impersonation of, of I think drone it's really wah-wahs. good. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've been in the game. I know a thing or two because I've seen a thing or two. But then yeah. the wah-wahs speed up. And then if you hear them starting to speed up, right, so you're theoretically you're moving your drone and the wah-wahs are speeding up. If you hear that phenomenon, stop, turn around, go the other way. Until we mm-hmm. want to get the, we wanted to get it to stop such that my litmus test for tuning is that I can only hear one thing that I can only mm, hear. That, okay. Yeah. So like two tenor drones are going, but I can't tell, right? Because mm-hmm. they're tu- they're tuned and they're not beating so that I honestly am convinced that it sounds like just one drone. And with two tenor drones, mm. the, I wouldn't say it's easy. You were trying to be gentle earlier and you're trying to be really sensitive to everyone all the listeners out there because tuning two tenors together is not easy right but bad news even worse news it's the easiest it's ever gonna get when it comes to tuning a bad pipe right (laughs) so it's as easy as it's it's ever gonna get thing on the whole thing yeah and by the way we're we've left out tons of details like do your bagpipes hold air can you blow steadily right those are big ones. Are they calibrated? All that yeah. Kind of are the reeds set up so that they're capable of being tuned? Are the tongues of the reeds bent off to the side? Like all of those little details. We're skipping those mm. today. We're just pretending that is in good shape. And then even then, tuning the two tenors can be quite tricky. Mm. But those are two identical things. There you go. The end. No, we want to talk about mm-hmm. tuning the bass drone. Tuning the bass drone yeah. is... Yeah. I, like what you're describing so far is useful and interesting. But there is a part of me that's kind of like... Uh huh. Yes. Check. 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 Mm-hmm. But what about the bass drone? Right. You know? <laughs> is the bass drone harder to bring into tune than the two tenors? Here's the thing. I, conceptually, I think probably you're going to tell me no. It's the same idea, right? I'm going to tell you. I'm me, actually going to tell you. Yes. Experience. Spoiler alert. I'm going to tell you it oh, is good. harder. But that makes me feel better. I wanted to be <laughs> Socratic about it and see and just see you become uncomfortable. Oh, I'm always uncomfortable. That's my secret. But my, one of the things that is, it's like, it's, I don't want to say that it's like a benefit necessarily, because I know it's not really, but like part of the issue here is that because I'm having a hard time clicking into how my bass drone is doing, it's really easy for me to ignore, like super easy for me to be like, my pipes sound fine and just yeah. carry on having a good time. For sure. It's this sneaking suspicion in the back of my head that they could sound better. That it's driving me to want to improve with this. So first of all, the bass drone, in my estimation is harder to bring into tune than any of the other drones or than any other aspect Mm. of the instrument, really. It's the hardest element. Oh, then even the chanter. I think so. Now, here's a couple of things. Mm. Number one, I don't know if you've ever played piano. I know you've played piano, but the lower notes, or have you ever composed anything for piano or for a couple of different instruments? I really learned this. We learned this the hard way. Uh, during, so I have a music composition degree from Simon Fraser University. Toot toot. Matt Welch and I actually did the same program. And another great piper named uh, Sylvia. Alma Mater, shout out. Yeah, another great, another great piper called Sylvia Dittar, somewhere out there in the world. We actually did the program at the same time. But anyway, it was music composition mm. 
And one of the things you learn the hard way, and our professors were great about letting us learn this the hard way, but you can't actually, you can, okay? But when you compose a lot of low notes happening at the same time, the lower the note goes, the muddier it tends to sound, right? So when you're composing, mm. let's say I'm composing for a cello and also for a piano, and the cello and the piano are all playing a bunch of notes way down low. It sounds like a hot, muddy mess because those lower frequencies, and it makes sense if you think about it, they're, the waves are actually, they take a lot more time and a lot more space to actually physically happen, right? So to get them mm. to harmonize well together or to get them to match is very tricky and tends to come out sounding very muddy. And I think that same thing is true with the bass drone. It's because it's so low in pitch, it's actually harder for us to hear. I think the bass drone is mm. a, approximately 120 hertz. That's dangerously close mm. to the bottom end of frequencies that the human ear can detect. It's close. It's, it's really getting low. down there. And it tends to be harder to hear the frequencies when they're that low. It just, by the way, if anyone strongly disagrees with me, I'd love to be educated, but this is just my experience. They're very low, so they're hard to hear. And the other thing is they don't have as much energy. They're quieter. I think the bass drone is quieter mm. than the tenors. Don't know that for a fact. It just seems to be my experience. And maybe also the fact that the sound comes out further away from my ears is a big thing. Think about the tenor drones. They're literally lower in space. So we're actually maybe yeah. able to hear those because they're closer to the ear. And then the bass drone is like way up there. You might get a little bit of vibration from the wood, like laterally, but the bass drone is also mm. further away. And then finally, it's the only one of its kind on the instrument. Two tenors, to tune them together is not that bad because they're going to literally resonate together because they're literally the same thing. The bass drone is different. How much lower is the bass drone than the tenors? It's just a little pop quiz. Using my Pythagorean reasoning, I might guess that's... twice as low, but maybe that's right. not true. And then th there's a musical word for that. What's a musical word for twice as low? 8VA? <laughs> You're just being a nerd now, 8VB. 8VB. No. I went what the wrong What Jim is trying to say <laughs> is he's trying to say it's one octave lower than... Uh, oh, an octave. That's right. Than the tenors, that's the word. Right? That's what 8VA, I think, stands for. VA is an octave above. 8VB is an octave below. Oh, there you go. Who knows? Man, your level of nerddom is even beyond mine. But yeah, it's, just, that's the I, musical I, yeah. word <laughs> I'm out of my means. depth, so I'm flexing what muscles I have. That's all. Yeah. An octave means what Jim was saying. In music, an octave is something that's, it's playing the same note, basically, but it's actually twice the frequency. I have my, no, I don't have my piano here. It's covered with a bunch of stuff right now. But you have low A and then you have high A. Those two notes are basically the same note, but the, the high A is double the frequency of the low A, right? And then mm -hmm. the bass drone, fun fact, is half the frequency of the tenor drone, right? And sitting there on, by itself on an island. And I think it's quieter, and I think that it's muddier and actually physically harder to hear than the tenor. <laughs> Sorry, looking at the piano, looking at the dust all over the piano made me sneeze. <laughs> um, Have you ever had the experience, Andrew, of wearing um, like overhead ear protection, similar to the headphones we're wearing right now? Yes. And having a hard part of the frame touch your bass drone and how the, the buzz of it via the contact just fills your ears all of a sudden? Yes, exactly. Yep. I've had that happen a few times. That's, uh, I, I don't know what to say about it other than that's when I've become suddenly conscious of what my bass drone sounds like. Because like you mentioned, it's usually so far away from me. Do you ever notice when you, know, you do way that? Up above my head. Yeah. And then do you ever notice when you do that, the note that you hear is not A? I, I haven't done it enough to have noticed that. No, that, yeah. that's really interesting. Yeah. The note that you're hearing when you accidentally get that thing where your ear touches your bass drone, it's like not A. It's E and maybe a little mm. bit of C or something. And you're like, wait, why is it not A? What's going on with that? Huh. Some, some kind of harmonic thing going exactly. on. Exactly. Huh? That's where I'd like to go next, Jim. Mm. One of the reasons the bagpipe sounds so awesome is that we play four instruments simultaneously at the same time. Think about that for a second. Chanter, drone, drone. Four instruments at the same time, but also all of those instruments are harmonically rich right? We are pretty awesome as bagpipers, aren't we? It's definitely very unique. I, I think a criticism of the bagpipe would be that there's too much, right? There's, it's so mm. rich, right? It's actually difficult to find an application where it doesn't overwhelm what you're doing. 
which mm -hmm. which then points to the fact that we do tend to like to play by ourselves, don't we? Or just with other pipers. We should do. Yeah. So that <laughs> yeah. might so it's a cool thing about the instrument, but it's also a potential criticism. It's also a potential downside. But it's extremely harmonically rich. But what are harmonics? Oh, okay. Here maybe I can say it. Harmonics would be regular divisions of frequencies. The octave is like a half or doubling. What if you did 1.5 or right or like 1.3? Those those kinds of divisions are both played at the same time. That's a harmonic. Sure. Yeah. Another good way of thinking about harmonics is toilet paper. You ever have toilet paper? Okay. <laughs> You ever have toilet paper that just disintegrates in your hand and you're like, what is this cheap toilet paper? You ever had that experience? Yeah, yep. That's yeah. like a flute. It's, it's, it's like a, a load of BS no, just... when, the, when the single ply rolls are trying to sell themselves based on how many squares there are next to the, dub, the two ply rolls. That's a load of BS, the, those single yeah. ply rolls. Cause but you, have you ever had a triple ply? ply? Have you ever had a That's triple ply? That's... Triple ply is like... I haven't had a triple ply experience. Is that like heaven? What's interesting is you say that, that some people try and sell it by the square, right? So my point is, it doesn't matter how many ply your toilet paper is. It's a, it, when you're using it, what are you thinking of it as? You're thinking of it as a square of toilet paper, right? It doesn't really matter how many ply it is. It could be one ply. It could be 10 ply. In your mind, it's toilet paper, right? But in reality, toilet paper could have any number of layers which changes the experience. By the way, I've never okay. used this so analogy before. I, I feel like I'm really floating. <laughs> I'm really walking on the edge here with the, but it's, it, I think it might turn out to be a phenomenal analogy. I think it's working because I'm thinking to myself, theoretical 30 ply toilet paper, yes. 50 ply toilet paper. It's getting more and more like soft, thick, rich, yes. full. Which I is think good. It's making sense. The experience of it is very rich, very velvety, right? Mm -hmm. But but there's definite mm -hmm. downsides too. We talk. It's not necessarily all good, but but boy, that's going to be a comfy experience. Thoughts? Even though it's just toilet paper, it's all going to the same place. It's all serving the same purpose, right? There could be a variety of different types of richnesses and textures, right? And it has to do with mm -hmm. it has to do with the ply. It has to do with how the actual layers. Uh, combine on each other. Anyway, musical sound is the same way. A clarinet could play the note A, and a flute could play the note A, uh, and they sound the same pitch, right? They can still play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, but when a flute plays it, it sounds different than when a clarinet plays it. Do you agree? A clarinet kind of sounds... Oh, absolutely. clarinet yeah. sounds mellow and hollow. A flute sounds pure and, I don't know, pure and not not really hollow at all. I don't know, really know how you would describe a flute, but my point is they're playing the same notes, but I, they I sound I kind of hesitate. The word that comes to my mind is piercing, but I wouldn't want that to come across as a negative thing, yeah. just direct sure. in a way. Yeah, absolutely. So anyway, Jim, I shared a quick image here. This is a frequency mm -hmm. response rendering of my bass drone. So when I did the tuning algorithm course, when I built it, I did a couple of things. This is a just... I don't know what you would say. It's a, a rendering of the frequencies of me recording my bass drone. And you can see these are the frequencies present when I play the bass drone. And you can see there's more than one. So when I play, the bass drone is a piece of toilet paper with many plies. There's many plies. Yeah, here. I'm, I'm counting 34 maybe layers. Yeah, and that's just, what my, that's just what my cheap microphone can pick up right? That's only going... That's from one drone is what you're saying. Yeah, th and this is just from me playing one drone into a microphone. So we could see that the first, mm -hmm. the biggest of the humps, so to speak, right? The, the layer of the sound with the most energy is approximately where, and we already said the number today, it's approximately at 120, 120 mm -hmm. vibrations yeah. per second. Can you see that's where the hump is? And then mm -hmm. fascinatingly, the next layer is at what frequency? Is that about 15 oh the next in order from there yeah, over the, I was the next one the to next the right tall one yep the next one to the right oh, the next one to the right i bet that's 240 exactly. if the first one's 120 i bet that's 240 yep. yeah conceptually this is how the physics of a reeded instrument is going to work right so the, the for the bass drone the loudest harmonic is going to be the first one and we actually have a special name for it it's mm. called the fundamental so the fundamental frequency is going to be the loudest and here it's right there around 120. And we know where to expect the next one because it's all doublings of the fundamental. So the first harmonic of a sound is double the frequency. 
220, or sorry, 240 rather. And then look, we can see the next one. Now the next one is maybe not where you would initially expect. You're like, oh, what's double of 220? Double of, or sorry, I keep saying 220. Right, or 240. Yeah, so you're right. tempted to expect the next one to happen at 480, but that's not the way music works. It's multiples of the fundamental. What's two times 120? You got 240. And you can see it here in real life. I think that's why this picture is so cool. Is This is not made yeah, up. Yeah, this is giving me chills, yeah. actually. Like, at first, this was just a bunch of squigglies, and now all of a sudden I'm seeing, like, oh, there's a thing going on yeah, here. This exactly. is cool. Yep, exactly right. I remember when I was in music school and we started to learn about this, and then I went back to my house and I recorded my drones just like this, and I was like, oh, mm. wait, I see. It makes total sense. And it's, it's crazy. Everywhere. Yeah, you get the chills. <laughs> but anyway, so the next harmonic is not two times the fundamental, it's now three times. So what's three times 120? There's our 360. Right, and then in- And it lines up right there In my image, That's you can see like. it right there at 360, right? And yeah. then what's the next fundamental gonna be? It's gonna be four <laughs> times, right? And so you would expect to see it around 480. And where do you see it? You see it at 480. There it is, 480. Right? So our musical sounds, especially with the bagpipes, but with all musical sounds, it's not just the note A. Note A is just the fundamental frequency, right? So the bass drone is, we're the, it's not just A120, it's that plus all of its constituent harmonics, many plies of toilet paper every time we play. I'm, I'm sure that everybody listening is already way ahead of me, right? But I'm just being so delighted by this that then I go to the next one, I think it should be 600, and it's exactly on the line. That's right. And then I think the next one should be 720, and there it is, just barely past the 700 line. Yes. It's just, this is super cool. Yep. What a cool thing. It's really cool. And then what you'll find, right? So what makes the clarinet sound different than the flute is that different instruments have different levels of harmonic response, meaning that the flute, and actually I sent you, a, I sent you another diagram that we put together that shows some traditional instruments. Yeah. We've got the oboe, the clarinet, the flute, and the trumpet. And we can see that the arrangement and the amplitude, so the, vo the volume in layman's terms, mm -hmm. the arrangement and the amplitude of these different harmonics is different. And that's what gives each instrument its own unique sound. By the way, it's also what makes Jim's voice sound different than mine. If we both sing Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, Jim will sound different than Shall me. Shall we? No, please no. Jim will sound <laughs> different than me because... Our bodies are a little bit different, so the harmonic production that we're going to do is going to be a little bit different. By the way, it's also why Angus McCall's drones sound different than Jack Lee's drones, right? They're all doing the same thing, oh, yeah. but they could have different drone reads in. They could have different pipe bags. They mm. could have different makes of drones. And so bagpipe timbres, amongst other bagpipers, can be different and unique as well. Just have a look at this diagram, though. It's pretty cool. One of the things that's super unique about the oboe is that the fundamental frequency is not the loudest. Can you see that? Right. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. really weird. And that's the, what gives the, the oboe... What's it, going on there? It's like the fourth over. Exactly. And, and that's pretty rare, although you'll see it also happens in the trumpet. But it's pretty rare. But anyway, the fourth harmonic, actually, technically, and I think to be technically correct, I would say the third harmonic, because you have the fundamental... Oh, sure, after that. Yeah, but mm. I, I digress. It doesn't really matter. But that fourth layer is actually the loudest. And that's what gives the oboe that super cool, haunting, piercing, special sound that the oboe has. And then the, cl yeah, the clarinet okay. is also freaking fascinating, where every other harmonic it's like fourth, has a high forth, amplitude, huh? and then all the even-numbered harmonics have very low amplitude. What the heck is up with is that? Is this what's... Is it the, wait, I think a lot of us who have any kind of equalizer, be it virtual or uh, physical knobs on the, the car stereo or our apps, we've probably had the experience of playing with levels. Yeah. I've never really known what was going on there, but I feel like, is this showing me if I turned up the mid or the high or the low, is it just the low, middle and high chunks of these frequencies that I'm yeah. bringing more amplitude to when I do that? Yeah. I mean, well, you're basically just giving more or less amplitude to different specific frequency ranges. Now, unfortunately, mm. it's not going to be able to, let's say, for example, if I'm playing the, a bagpipe melody, right? Whenever I play a low A, I get the low A harmonic range. But mm. then if I play an E, remember, that's 50% higher in frequency to start with. 
and then all the other harmonics would move. So unless the uh, mm. car stereo could magically follow the exact melodic line, you're not going to be able to listen to the specific harmonics as a piece of music carries on. But yeah, that's it's all the same basic yeah. concept. And you'll notice that it has a good equalizer will have the numbers along the bottom, and then the those numbers represent the hertz, the frequency ranges. Mm. But anyway, super cool. Trying to keep on track here, Jim. So that yes. harmonics make the world go round, right? So you can see different mm -hmm. types of instruments have different harmonics. So anyway, the next diagram I've prepared for you. By the way, this is all part of our tuning algorithm course at the dojo. But this next one is actually we reworked it, but this is from Captain John McClellan's book about tuning. The exact name is escaping me. It's called it's the notation one of those the and, long subtitle. It's right? called the notation and tuning of the Highland Bagpipe by Captain John A. McClellan, MBE, printed in 1982. But anyway, this is an incredible book. It's the first of its kind that I know of. I know Matt Welch and I love to nerd out about this. But anyway, he's written here the notes, like he's written here the harmonics of each of our instruments written on the grand staff here. By the way, this was when bagpipes were lower in pitch. So instead of A120, can you see how he's got A115? Ah, uh, yes. Way down here. Yeah. Okay. But then you can, he writes out the harmonics directly above it. So the first harmonic is A230. That's one octave above, mm -hmm. right? And then, by the way, the next harmonic, remember, it's not double of this, it's double of that. Uh -huh. What note does the second harmonic actually play? It actually plays the note E. Right, because it's the pitch is oh, 345. Yeah. Gotcha. So the harmonics actually so represent we, different notes. Yeah. And it, it, he keeps extrapolating if we hop ahead upward. to the A. Yeah, I see it now. So they're all. Because the, if, if I just hopped A to A, those are doubling on each other, but we've got the scale happening in between. That's where we got the int, int, intervals of 115. Exactly. Each time you add 115 hertz. So we have 230, we have 345. The next harmonic is another A. But then the next harmonic is a C, then we have an E, then we have a G, then we have an A. And it all just works like that. Mm. It's crazy, right? Now, that's the bass drone. Now, here's, this is where the topic of today is really going to start to unfold for us. So those are the bass mm -hmm. drone harmonics. Now, the tenor drone is doing the same thing, but it's doing it an octave higher. And you're like, oh, easy, but it's actually not that easy. So have a look at the tenor. The tenor is tuned to A230 in this diagram. When you're trying to tune your bass drone, what's the average person listening to? The average person is listening to the low, low fundamental pitch of the bass drone because you're yeah. trying to tune the yes, bass drone. Yes, that's my problem. Yes, yeah. But yeah. The, if you listen to the low fundamental frequency of the bass drone while you're trying to tune the bass drone, does it have any friends that you can compare it to? It's got no friends. It's, got it's no all by itself down there. No friends. So one of the secrets, and Stuart Little, one year at a summer school, I heard him say, when you tune the bass, here's my secret. Listen to the tenors while you tune the bass drone. And suddenly, mm. a bunch of students that previously could not do it, suddenly they could do it. And here's why. Because it's the first harmonic of the bass drone that has friends. And yeah, because it's got the, two friends. Exactly. So the tenors... Okay, or let's pretend you're just tuning Ideally, one. I guess I should yeah. say. <laughs> let's pretend you're tuning one tenor and the bass together, yeah. right? Listen to the tenor because the fundamental frequency of the tenor is going to tune with the first harmonic of the bass. And you'll, it's mm -hmm. tricky, but you'll hear the relationship between the tenor and the bass in that way, and you'll be able to eliminate the beats by listening to the tenor drone. Oh. Wow. So it's it's almost like you're you're making it so that you're really just listening to three tenors instead of Correct. a bass and two tenors. Right, you are. And the 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 actual pitch of the bass, the low pitch, is gonna sort itself out. And by the way, if there was some sort of imperfection there, it would be pretty difficult for anyone to notice as long as the first harmonic and the tenors lined up. This is how physics works. This is why the bass is tricky to tune, because most of us are accidentally unknowingly trying to do something that's impossible to do. This is the main reason. This is cool. I, when I look back at your waveform of the frequencies from your bass drone, if I had to do this trick with the 7th or 10th or 12th harmonic over, I feel like that would be really hard because those waves are so teensy. Yeah. But the second one over is pretty big. It's almost as big as the first Correct. one. So that gives me some hope that maybe I can actually lock into that. Yes, exactly. And every now and then, now an advanced tuner knows this. 
and people who don't have as much experience, you might not know this, but when you really get in the zone and your pipes are really dialed in, you start to hear all sorts of funny notes coming through in the drones. Sometimes you hear a C, mm. sometimes you hear an E, sometimes you hear whatever, and you can see why that might be because there's little harmonics. And every now and then, if you get several harmonics, let's say a C or something to line up, suddenly it's going to be super resonant and super dialed in. That makes sense. That makes sense of two experiences that I've had that otherwise I don't have an explanation for. One being listening back to recordings. And I think part of that is being removed from being like inside the instrument myself. And like sometimes the drones sound like they're playing a different note. Mm -hmm. But the other experience is that sometimes my bagpipes sound extra good on a tune that uses a lot of A's and C's and E's, but not so great on tunes that use a lot of D's and F sharps and stuff like that. Yes. And sometimes the opposite is true. And I wonder if that's because through some accident of where exactly I tuned, I managed to hit a harmonic that would resonate strongly with my C, but not with my D or something like Absolutely. that. Absolutely. And chances are, right? Chances are that it may be in some cases you've accidentally locked in some of the chanter notes. And what do I mean by locked in? I mm. mean, they're actually, and unfortunately for now, maybe accidentally, they're really resonating yeah. with the other frequencies. Let me draw your attention to the final thing I've shared with you here. And this, again, is mm -hmm. from Captain John's booklet here. We've just redone it. But you can see here he shows a diagram of what chanter notes should line up with what harmonics. And it's really interesting, right? So you could see. Okay, yeah. And it gets really funky. For example, when you play low A, obviously, you can see the low A lining up with the fourth or rather the third harmonic of the bass and the second harmonic of the tenors, right? And you can see other things as well. For example, when you play the note E, it actually lines up with the sixth harmonic of the bass, I believe. And it lines up with the third harmonic of the tenors. I mean, you just have to kind of look at it. Uh, I'm sure if you're listening to this, you're probably cursing at your radio right now. But yeah, things line mm -hmm. up in a certain way. If we play the note B, for example, that the note B itself is probably not going to line up directly with any harmonics from the drones, but the harmonics from the note B are likely to. And the more we play, oh, okay. right? Does that make sense? Who knows what the, yeah, I'd have yeah. to, we'd have to look at it, but who knows what the harmonics of the note B are and how they would correspond to the harmonics that are provided from the drones. But a beautifully tuned bagpipe, generally speaking, has uh, masterfully aligned as many of the, those harmonics as they can. That's really interesting. Like sometimes thinking about drone instruments as all of us do, I'm sure, as bagpipers, I've wondered if the, if the good thing that can be said about those notes that don't seem to have a place with the drones, like the B, for example, I've wondered before if like maybe it's there because there's something about dissonance sure. making it so resonance then sounds extra good. So I play a B a little bit, but then when I resolve to an A, that like makes it sound really good. Yep, It's slightly off topic. But sometimes I hear... But I just want to comment oh, on that. Ahead. I think you're absolutely correct. I think when people play Pibrock, for example, they regularly play with the B and the low G definitely out of tune by the standard I just spoke about in, in the sense that mm. they're, we're not perfectly lining up those harmonics. And that's because... You're absolutely right. Listening to pure perfection is actually not that interesting. And so a lot of times pipers will purposefully uh, detune things ever so slightly so th to, to achieve what you're talking mm -hmm. about. It's in the same spirit of adding distortion to your electric guitar. It's the, a, little bit of, uh, a little bit of yuck can really yum up the sound. Nice. <laughs> Well, I know this is also used with some uh, accordions and concertinas. They call it wet tuning, mm -hmm. where you'll have two reeds that if dry tuning, yeah. they'd be playing exactly the same. Yep. <clears throat> but you, sh you shave one of them down a bit, so it's just a little off. You get that, that iconic accordion sound. It's called wet tuning because yes. it's got just a little bit of dissonance in there. Yeah, it reminds me in digital music, there's an effect called chorusing you can add as well, which achieves very much the same thing. Mm. It's sort of a purposeful, mm. uh, a purposeful detuning of the sound in a certain way that gives it a little bit of depth and a little bit more interest. Yeah. Mm. I don't feel like I have this figured out so that I could say exactly why, but I feel like 
I'm on the cusp of seeing something make sense where I have heard Piper's play before where those notes that I don't think should work do seem to work really well. Yeah. And I think, oh, okay, so now I'm thinking you have an option. You can have your B, for example, be outside of harmonizing for sake of dissonance on purpose or just by accident. And you can, by accident or on purpose, maybe get your B to lock into some interval with the drone where it actually does sound good. And that explains why sometimes I listen to Piper's playing and they hit those what should be yucky notes and it sounds yummy mm -hmm. instead, right? Exactly. That's really interesting. Yeah, yeah, it really is interesting. And who knows, right? So there's too much going on here for any one human brain to process all of it at the same time. It's just not going to happen, right? <laughs> but and you're laughing, yeah. but it's also definitely true, right? There's too many. Every right. time you yeah. change notes, now we're listening to a whole different relationship of harmonics, right? And then we're doing that yeah. kind of quickly. We're doing that in certain patterns, right? We've got ACE, ACE, then we got ADF, ADF, and we've got low G and B and D, right? And we're working through chord progressions and different combinations and all sorts of interesting things are happening. Maybe we're playing some harmonies, right? So there's this incredible intermingling of different layers of harmonics and how different things are lining up and how different things are jumping out at us. And so there you go. It's infinitely, there's infinitely much to hear. I think that's why drone music is so effective. You're not really just mm. playing. It's not a note playing underneath what you're playing. That's not what it is, right? Mm. It's a note that's providing like this sort of infinitely like a layer, you know, many plies of toilet paper in an infinite layer of things that could potentially resonate. And then things pop out at you. Play a great, play a mm. B minor chord on top of an A drone. And suddenly it's a lot different than it was before. A lot of people are like, you got to test your harmonies with the drone, which is true because things that are theoretically good when you write harmonies might not come out sounding great in real life. Cool. So you got to test it against the drone. But also, I never worry about the drone because I know that it's going to sound really interesting no matter what. And maybe you want to change it mm. for aesthetic reasons at some point in the future, but it's going to be it's going to be good no matter what as long as the instrument mm. is is sounding good. I actually have a funny story about that. Yep. Will you will you tell it to us? Sure. One time back in the day, we were practicing the Hourglass Suite in the SFU pipe band. And there's a point in the hourglass suite where I built in like this harmony that just adds in one note at a time and you end up with a full, rather disturbing sounding chord of everybody playing the whole scale all at once. And it's, a, but it's uh. disturbing, but it's also surprisingly wicked cool sounding. However, when we were practicing it and it wasn't going perfectly and, you know, it was sort of a needlessly complex piece of music. But anyway, I remember Reed Maxwell coming in from the drummer's room, coming in being like, what is this garbage? Sounds yeah. super crappy. And I hope that at the end of the day, listening back, most people can agree. At, at minimum, it's a wicked cool effect and it's rarely heard on the pipes. But yeah, just play all the notes at the same time against the drone. And it's a, a sort of wacky effect anyway. Yeah, I, w I wonder if uh, very many pipe majors or sergeants, et cetera, can relate to like having come up with a harmony that you know is going to work, but then when you sit around with practice chanters to try it for the first time, it sounds horrible, and your bandmates are all like, what were you thinking? You know, yeah. like, no, if we're in tune, it'll work, I promise. Well, yeah, <laughs> maybe. Uh, yep, exactly. And then, of course, practice chanters, they obey the same sound rules as any other instrument does. But practice chanters are usually only ever approximately tuned. They're not usually dialed in. Practice chanters can only give us sort of an approximate feel of what it's going to be. The bagpipe itself is actually different in the sense that we only like the sound when it's tuned extremely well, right? And uh, but that gives yeah, us that gives us amazing it's yeah, it's an amazing opportunity though, and it's why pipe bands are the greatest show on earth because you're getting like twenty mm. pipers at a time beautifully locked and then the the sound that you achieve from that is extremely rare and super super cool i mean it's so seldom heard though it's so hard to do it's so so hard to do i, I don't part, think part of what makes it so special though right yeah it only comes up every once in a while yep it surprises you every time exactly and what's funny is you take it for granted so soon too i don't think people mm -hmm. i don't think 
I don't think the average pipe bander appreciates the SFU pipe band enough. Because wow. we've got used to listening yeah. to them so much. You get used to listening to it and you're like, oh mm. yeah, there's SFU again. But it's like, no, no, like you don't mm. understand. And, and the same goes in Scotland. You go to Scotland and there's all these incredible grade one bands. Even just watching them warm up is incredible, right? But people don't really pay it much mind. When we were brought up, me and my people here in the Northeast of the U.S., we yeah. didn't have anything like that. The, the closest, mm -hmm. you, you'd have to go all the way to Ontario to hear a great band when I was a kid. Uh, and again, apologies to any great bands that maybe I'm forgetting about, but I remember there was the City of Detroit pipe band that was very good, but they're so far away from us. Hardly ever got to hear them. Mm -hmm. And so when you did hear a band that was good, it was second to none. You couldn't, you can't describe really stood the sound. Out. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that first time experience that any of us has, if uh, SFU travels close to us or if we go to the Worlds or something, that's special. But um, maybe if we do that too many times, we become numb to it. Is there anything special going on here, Andrew? As I look at this diagram that has the, the chanter, then the bass drone, then the two tenors, I noticed that the low A on the chanter is at 460. That's the fourth harmonic for the bass drone and the second for the tenors. So those are that's really even intervals, fourth and second. Mm -hmm. And then I move up to the E, and the same thing happens. It's the 690, 690, 690. That's the sixth on the bass and the third on the tenors. Right. Go up to high A, it's the eighth and the fourth. It's like this. Is this like a turducken situation where it's like there's like turducken? areas of like super resonance? Like when you, yeah, turducken, when you right? Kick the duck inside the turkey? It, yeah. Because I'm just thinking we've got like levels of resonance going on, but it seems almost like every once in a while you hit like this like level of like super resonance where it's like Correct. these regular, I guess those are some of our strong notes though. That makes sense. I mean, we start with, that's so interesting. Our striking note is an E yeah. and it's one of those super resonant notes. Uh-huh. Let me ask you this. When you tune your pipes, what notes do you, what note do you do first? We all know this. We do low A A's, first, A's across right? the board, yeah. Yeah, low A for yeah. sure. And, but there's a physics reason why. Right. It's because mm. the low A is the single, that's the single focal point for the entire instrument where the most lower level harmonics are going to intermingle. That's why. Period. Mm. And sorry. So you think you do it because low A, but the real reason you do it is because physics. Like low A is where it all, mm. that's where it all comes together. Every other note position on the chanter is going to be considerably further away from home base than just low A is. That's why we've got to get the low A right. However, the next note you would listen to would be maybe the high A, right? But the high A tends to be a little bit of a throwaway note because it's much quieter than the other notes. And sometimes stylistically, pipers are playing a little bit flatter. And then, yeah, the next note on your list would be the E, making sure the E lines up. We all know this. And then the C might be the next one, maybe. But then it gets all weird and interesting, yeah. It's fact. This does bring something to mind, though, Andrew, the practicality of what I often end up doing when I'm tuning myself. I end up playing a kind of faked D because I take my bottom hand off yep. and I want to keep the pressure for the chanter going. I don't want my pressure to drop a bunch because then what I'm doing doesn't matter to the drones, right? Because then mm -hmm. I bring the chanter back in. It's different. Maybe I should lift my ring finger and be doing that on a kind of faked, but E, because maybe that, because that, that E looks like it's way more likely to resonate yeah. across the board with the drone. Fun fact, that's how my dad always tuned his drones. But the problem with the E, when you take the hand off, is that the E will be... It, yeah, it's not quite right. It's actually going to be considerably flatter, I think, than, <laughs> than when you play the E with the correct, the bagpipingly correct fingering, right? So you could do that, but really, when we're tuning the drones, we really need to be ignoring the sound of the chanter in general. First of all, because the mm. goal is not to tune the drones to the chanter, right? When we're up there tuning the drones, mm. our, what, our mission is to get all three drones locked in together, and then we tune, it, we tune those relative to the chanter in a separate step. So when we're up there tuning the drones, we really want something we can easily ignore. I think the D is a good one. You can mm. see why, by the way, the D is actually a particularly yeah, that's ignorable a good point. note because things aren't really super always lining up there. By the way, a D with or without the pinky probably changes the least uh, of all the false notes mm. or, or the high A, which is what most pipers use. High A is quiet. It's, set, it's pretty it close to the octave huh? and then it's going to disappear and into the thing. So it tends to be what pipers use, but really... Our job when we're up there tuning the drones is to just be locking the drones themselves together. And then we would plot our adjustment relative to the chanter later on. I forgot the exact question you had there, but oh yeah, the, the um, E is going to go yeah. flat though. So you don't want to lock yeah. the drones into that flat sounding E because if you do, 
then you're gonna have to redo it later. Yeah, flat drones. Yeah, you're gonna have flat yeah. drones. Yeah. Andrew, I've probably forced this to go longer than it needed to just because it's blowing my mind so much. I just am hopping back and forth between these diagrams, having fun, doing math, and imagining scenarios. <laughs> yep, exactly. Just remember that it doesn't matter how well you understand the scenarios and the, the theory of it. You would never be able to follow it in real life, right? You, there would, there's yeah, so, that's so cool. It's infinitely Even complex. You look at this for a while and... You, yeah, eventually you just kind of have to back up and be like, does this sound good? All it is, right? Remember in the picture that I took, the actual picture of real life, how many harmonics do we see there? I, I'm just going to count. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. So even up to 6,000 hertz, right? We, we have well over 30. And, and in our diagrams, how many do we have? In our diagram here, the base shows one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Right? So there's still 20 mm. more audible harmonics that this diagram's not even showing. And then the, the yeah. tenor drones are only showing four. And the, the chanter intervals here are, aren't really showing many at all. They're not showing any. So this. There's, there's got to be more in both cases. Oh, yeah. Huh? Many, many more. And I think the chanter, the yeah. double read of the chanter, I think tends to produce even more harmonics than the than the drones, mm. right? So there's way more going on here. This is just a super simple now, illustration. Now I, now I want to see a picture like what you did with the bass drone with a chanter reed, but also I want to see it with a brand new chanter reed that's like thick and hard to play. And I want to see that next to an old chanter reed that's become close to dying out. Mm -hmm. And I, I wonder how many differences there would be in like how many harmonic resonance there are for sure and uh, i think that's a big thing so one of the things that you have to be careful with when you use moisture control in your instrument uh, is that it has a negative it can have a negative impact on the timbre of your sound and you have to be really aware of that and you have to be able to notice that so you have to be able to notice when your chanter is thin and what does thin mean thin means absence of a lot of the harmonics that we'd like to have particularly in the high end right and then when you have a chantery that's playing in a sheepskin bag there's probably a, a, a level of ongoing moisture there that's helping the reed just really, for lack of a better word, blossom into having many more mm -hmm. harmonics that are rich. And the more harmonics you have that are rich, the more harmonics that can resonate with the other aspects of the instrument. And so understanding the richness is a huge part of the game. No one wants to listen to a bagpipe mm -hmm. that is missing a bunch of its quintessential harmonics. I think that's a good place to end that, Jim. We're good. I That's feel like I've blown your mind. Man. Might be all the Red Bull. Hey, everybody. Andrew Douglas here from the Piper's Dojo. And I just want to say thanks so much for listening to today's iteration of the podcast. If you enjoyed what you heard here today, it would be super helpful to us and to a lot of bagpipers out there trying to find us. If you could give us a top-notch review on whatever platform you're using to listen to this podcast, particularly Apple, iTunes, and Spotify, and things like that, your review would be really, really helpful. So if you have a moment today, definitely go over there and help us out. Other than that, until we meet again on the podcast or somewhere else, thanks again for listening. <laughs>